Uh, welcome to the session on uh, Aboriginal issues. Uh, my name is Shin Imai. I'm uh, teaching at uh, Osgoode Hall Law School and I'm the academic director at Parkdale Community Legal Services. And my co-panelists are uh, John Otheus, uh, who's had a, a many years of experience in the Aboriginal law area, uh, represents the Innu among others, and he's from Morris Rose Leggett. And at the far end of the table is Stephen Smart from Osler Hoskin, who uh, represents the federal government in uh, self-government negotiations and also in uh, some of the residential school cases. The, uh, we're not, uh, uh, I, I think the audience is uh, probably composed of uh, some people who know quite a lot about this area and others uh, for whom some of this is quite new. So uh, we're gonna try to pitch it uh, to both. I, I hope that uh, we succeed in, in that everyone at least gets uh, something out of this uh, session. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, tremendous amount of legal activity in this area in the last five years. And if you'll turn to tab four of your uh, books, uh, you'll see that I've got on pages uh, 425 to 480, 28, a uh, list of cases, Supreme, these are just Supreme Court of Canada cases on uh, having to do with Aboriginal people. And you can see from that list that it covers quite a range from child welfare to criminal code to, uh, of course, cases that deal with Aboriginal and treaty rights. There's been a tremendous amount of development and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, continually uh, uh, breaking news. <clears throat> the, uh, what I'm gonna do first is just, uh, I guess, point out uh, the main trend uh, before we go on with the rest of the panel. And I guess the main trend uh, to remember when you're uh, listening to the panelists and when you're thinking about this area is that there's been a transition from looking at Aboriginal issues in the court as an issue of equality, formal equality, to uh, a transition to a situation where courts, legislatures, governments, uh, policymakers now look at Aboriginal peoples uh, giving recognition to their distinctive uh, cultures, their, their distinctive social context. And that's the difference. Just to illustrate what I mean, uh, one of the leading cases, and the leading case that I studied when I went to law school many years ago, was a case called R.V. Drybones. It's a 1970 case and it dealt with a provision in the Indian Act which made it illegal for an Indian person to be intoxicated in a situation where a non-Indian person was not breaking the law. So that was very easy. The court said, well, it's against the Bill of Rights. You can't treat one person differently because of race. The cases now are, do not deal with situations like that so much as situations that recognize the importance, the specificity of the Aboriginal context. So uh, one of the criminal law cases, or there's actually been two Supreme Court of Canada cases on new sentencing provisions in the criminal code, and you'll see that at the end of the list of Supreme Court of Canada cases there. It's R.V. Gladue and R.V. Wells. And the criminal code says that uh, you're supposed to consider, the judges are supposed to consider and pay particular attention to circumstances of Aboriginal offenders. That's right in the code. And so these Supreme Court of case, Canada cases are about, well, what's that mean? Uh, another area where this is happening is child welfare. In Ontario, British Columbia, and perhaps some other provinces, uh, the child welfare legislation provides that you have to consider the Aboriginal uh, aboriginality of the child. You have to take that into consideration. So what's that mean? Uh, and of course all the Aboriginal treaty rights cases uh, that uh, you see listed there and the ones with the Indian Act uh, deal with uh, the various facets of this issue. Uh, the main provision which you'll hear over and over again is section 35.1 of the Constitution Act which I'll let you read. 
The uh, quote from the secession case is uh, the former Chief Justice talking about the importance of uh, recognizing and the, the constitutional value of recognizing Aboriginal and treaty rights uh, in Canada. Now, I think that we won't uh, get into a very uh, detailed discussion. Practically every word in 35.1 has a meaning and uh, uh, it's been uh, picked on by uh, lawyers to, and academics. Uh, to an incredible degree, and so all this literature is very rich and interesting, although I'm uh, sure, and certainly as when I was a practitioner, I didn't have time to read all of this stuff. Uh, and I think that you'll, what we hope through this panel is to give you a, uh, an outline of uh, the main points or, or help you in your understanding of these issues. Uh, so I've given you the brief overview. Uh, next will be John Oltheus, who will talk about uh, evidence. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, maybe five minutes. Uh, we're going to try to keep ourselves to 15 or 20 minutes in our remarks. Uh, five minutes for one or two questions, and then we'll go on to uh, a presentation that I have. Uh, I'm going to challenge the provincial authority to develop resources on Crown lands. Uh, there'll be some questions after that, and then we'll finish off with uh, Stephen Smart, and he'll talk about self-government negotiations, and hopefully there'll be time for general questions at the end of all of this. Are there any questions? Jeez. Any comments? All right. Uh, John? Thank you very much, Shin, and uh, thank you all for being here. The uh, paper prepared by uh, my partner, Nancy Clear, and myself is at uh, tab five. And uh, I'll be referring to it uh, fairly often as we, we try and uh, do a bit of a landscape on the evidentiary issues. These issues have been uh, great importance ever since the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Calder, which was the Nishka case, uh, went to the Supreme Court uh, really because the, the government of the day said there are no such things as unextinguished Aboriginal and treaty rights. The court said there was, it led to the comprehensive claims policy and it led the Nishka to negotiate, and after 30 years of negotiation, uh, they've reached a treaty now that's uh, officially in place. Uh, Paulette case in the Northwest Territories was a similar situation. Uh, evidence about the treaty itself, the court said, well, there's some question about uh, some parts of the treaty. Canada then chose to negotiate and that's led to a number of uh, settlements, the uh, Satu, uh, the Dog Rib, the Gwich'in settlements in the Northwest Territories. Uh, Baker Lake was an Inuit case, uh, an injunction uh, application. Uh, the entire thing, and that was in 78 before we had Section 35, the entire uh, case took uh, 13 days. The court found there was a serious question to be tried related to uh, Aboriginal uh, title, and uh, uh, negotiations went on, and then you had the Nunavut uh, Agreement, and then the Nunavut, uh, creation of Nunavut as a government. Uh, in Delgamook, uh, which I'm not going to say much about, I think you all sort of know, or it's in the materials what Delgamook was about, but there were 318 days for presentation of evidence in that case, mostly evidence related to uh, Aboriginal title. And uh, at the end of that, uh, with respect to evidence, uh, the Chief Justice at the time said, and I'm at the bottom of page six, uh, echoed what 
the court had previously said, uh, Supreme Court in the Vanderpeet case in 96, that a court should approach the rules of evidence and interpret the evidence that exists with a consciousness of the special nature of Aboriginal claims and of the evidentiary difficulties in proving a right which originates in time when there were no written records of the practices, customs, and traditions engaged in. The court said they, they shouldn't undervalue this and if it doesn't conform precisely with the evidentiary standards that would be applied, for example, in a private uh, law torts case, uh, that should not be a problem. And then the uh, Chief Justice at the time went on to deal with oral history evidence. In Dalgamook at the trial level, the, the, the trial judge excluded the oral history evidence. One of the, the reasons that the tri trial judge gave is that this was, was evidence of advocates was evidence of, of, of chiefs and others who had been for a long time involved in the advocacy of Aboriginal and treaty rights. With respect to that issue, uh, the Chief Justice of the time said at uh, page seven, uh, the law of evidence has to be adapted so that the Aboriginal perspective on their practices, customs, and traditions, and on their relationship with the land are given due weight by the courts. In practical terms, this requires the courts to come to terms with the oral histories of Aboriginal societies, which for many Aboriginal nations are the only record of their past. And uh, the Chief Justice, the court uh, didn't substitute any findings, but said, You've got to go back, retry this case, and apply the rules of evidence, uh, the evidentiary uh, framework uh, set out by the court. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see whether Dalgamook ends up back in the courts or whether it might be settled uh, through uh, negotiations. And I think the issue that has emerged since then is the weight to be given to the Aboriginal oral history evidence. Uh, the court, Supreme Court in Dalgamook uh, criticized the trial judge for giving no independent weight to the oral evidence. But it also said that the court had to look very carefully at oral evidence before it decides what weight should be given to it. So that's a real question. You've got, you've got experts on both sides, sort of non-Aboriginal experts, and then you have the oral histories either of the chiefs or of, of, of anthropologists and others who have worked with Aboriginal peoples for a long time. There's gonna, the balancing of the court between the weight given to the different types of evidence is going to be an important uh, uh, thing to watch uh, over time. Most of the cases have involved uh, 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 Aboriginal rights as opposed to Aboriginal title. The court clarified that uh, uh, Aboriginal title is really a subset of Aboriginal rights. And in the Vanderpeet case, and I'm here on page 12, the court addressed the issue of what is a protected right under Section 35.1 of the Constitution. And the court said, in order to be an Aboriginal right, an activity must be an element of a practice, custom, or tradition integral to the distinctive culture of the aboriginal group claiming that right. So that was, that's now the measuring stick. That's the framework. And many of the cases since then have uh, uh, tried to or look at uh, evidence and uh, other matters, of course, as well in, in, in that context. And I'm going to just highlight uh, a few of those cases. In the uh, Jacobs case, BC uh, case, the defendant said they had an Aboriginal right to participate in the importation of uh, tobacco, that that was protected by Section 35. Both sides had expert witnesses, and the judge concluded that the Aboriginal defendant's expert evidence was more consistent with the evidence of the elders, yet it did not conform to all of that evidence. The trial judge said, this isn't fatal because, at page 14, 
I must interpret the elder evidence in a manner that accommodates and gives due weight to the Aboriginal perspective. I cannot fulfill my duty by insisting that all the evidence meet standards acceptable to social justice. And interesting, in that case, they found there was an Aboriginal right, but they found that the defendants were not acting pursuant to the uh, Aboriginal uh, right. Uh, then there's a series of cases uh, regarding meeting the evidentiary uh, burden at page 16. Uh, there's a, a Saskatchewan uh, case uh, in which uh, a birth mother of an Aboriginal person wanted to conduct the burial of his body in accordance with Aboriginal practices. And of course this had to be heard uh, very quickly. The court said there wasn't uh, sufficient evidence that it was in fact the burial custom that she was talking about was in fact a burial custom of the Onion Lake First Nation that amounted to an Aboriginal right. And in commenting on the Vanderpeet test, the court said the analysis that must that there must be, uh, is, it has to be extensive. And uh, this, this has been a theme throughout, throughout the cases. In the uh, Watt case, an uh, Aboriginal person living in BC, convicted for cultivating marijuana, said, I've got a right to stay in Canada, an Aboriginal right. Federal court sent it back to the adjudicator, and the court noted that there has to be very substantial evidence to address this issue, including the precise definition of the right claim, the existence of the historic practice upon which the right is based, and the relationship of that practice to the culture of an Aboriginal people in Canada. So the courts have been saying there's very high standard here to be met in uh, meeting uh, the Vanderpeet test. With respect to Aboriginal advocate uh, evidence, I've mentioned that uh, the, the Chief Justice in Delgamuk criticized the trial judge for excluding that, saying, uh, on the basis of this rationale for exclusion, the Aboriginal claimants who record their past through oral history are in the dilemma of never being able to establish a historical claim through the use of oral history in court, which is very true. And that's for either chiefs who have long been advocates and, and come forward and give evidence or uh, non-Aboriginal uh, uh, experts or Aboriginal experts uh, of, of another kind. There's some, some cases there, the Lac La Ronge case, uh, page 17, which was a treaty entitlement case, which the court, I think, probably fell into this uh, error of excluding evidence from Aboriginal advocates, although it's not clear because there was some analysis of the judge there that the Aboriginal witnesses were using current language as opposed to uh, actual language that would be used at, at the time. Um, now, there's a very interesting uh, set of cases, hunting and fishing cases, and the BC courts have been going one way on this and the Quebec courts another. The BC, uh, interesting case, Seward case in BC, page 19, the court there said that the evidence did not establish that hunting with a light at night was a crucial element of the distinctive culture of the Aboriginal person. However, the court said the evidence did establish there was an Aboriginal right characterized as an unrestricted right to hunt deer for food and ceremonial purposes. But the evidence was found not to establish that the activity of hunting at night had reached the level of being a preferred means, which of course is part of the justification test that was first set out in Sparrow. So the court says the applicants failed to show unjustifiable interference with an Aboriginal right. So there's a lot of evidence involved in, in, in looking at that. Quebec court in uh, St. Denis, a similar situation, hunting moose with a uh, light at night, the court said that was an unjustifiable interference with Aboriginal rights. And then in Mongrain, uh, very interesting and, and from the point of view of an Aboriginal perspective, uh, uh, an Aboriginal practitioner, a very refreshing decision of the court, where the court said that uh, Algonquins in the region 
had Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights for food purposes and that they were entitled to use all modern means available to carry out their hunting and fishing activities for food purposes, including using lights. The court also said that judicial notice could be taken of the fact that Aboriginal people have the right to fish and hunt for food purposes. But the court said that's only to hunt, uh, fish and hunt for food purposes. It doesn't extend to the right to harvest for ritual and social purposes or for commercial purposes, which the court said we're going to have to, you know, look at the evidence here. Now, in terms of an Aboriginal person that comes to you and says, well, you know, the provincial regulation says such, uh, I, I hunted with a different type of, of gear or, or whatever. I mean, telling that person, look, if we're going to defend this case, we're going to have to go back to pre-contact practices of your people. We're going to have to have, you know, many, many experts. This case is going to go on for, for, for months and years. I mean, they throw up their hands and say, well, you know, my God, I'm just, I've just been out fishing, which is a very normal kind of reaction. You say, no, no, pre-contact evidence is the important thing here. So that uh, would be very refreshing. The courts would follow, uh, and obviously this will end up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will follow what the Quebec uh, courts have said and not what the BC courts have said. There are a number of cases as well at page 20 on the uh, commercial or non-commercial trading variety. And of course, these are going to be very important as well as Aboriginal people try to get involved in the modern economy and try to say, well, these practices are an extension of what our people did. And again, you have to go pre-contact. The courts are looking for an enormous amount of evidence uh, if you're saying, no, no, commercial activity, say, in fishing or trading was part of what our people did pre-contact. And the Mitchell case is an important case there. And uh, I won't go through it, but the, the paper deals with it quite extensively. Just on the evidentiary question, uh, middle of page 21, the Nelson case, and there's going to be a lot more of these cases, two Aboriginal casinos and gambling. The court said uh, uh, these were people charged with having VLTs. They said it's an Aboriginal right because our people used to gamble, and so on and so forth. The court said the evidence uh, was found uh, the evidence supported a claim of a right to play and participate in traditional Ojibwe games to which the practice of gambling was found to be incidental but not independently integral to Ojibwe society. That's an interesting distinction. It was incidental but not independently integral to Ojibwe society. So I think a very fairly narrow interpretation of, of uh, what is integral. Uh, now, uh, the Mitchell uh, case, the trial judge was very clear in giving uh, substantial, uh, listened to, to the oral evidence, and, and Grand Chief Mitchell for years has been an advocate, but the court said, no, of course, he has, he has something to, to say on behalf of his people. And uh, we're going to listen to that. We're not going to exclude it because of the advocacy rule following closely what uh, Lemaire said in, uh, in Delgamuk on that issue. The final issue is, is uh, interlocutory injunctions. And uh, we're on page 24, and this is often what happens in Aboriginal practices. Somebody comes forward and says, uh, uh, Company X wants to explore on our land and we've got Aboriginal title. Uh, go and get an injunction to stop them. Well, you go and uh, and get an injunction, uh, try to get an injunction, and uh, the courts, well, first the issue of uh, consultation with respect to whether they can go ahead. I've noted the article by uh, uh, Sonia Lawrence and uh, uh, Patrick Macklin at the bottom of page 24 uh, on this. Uh, on the issue of, of uh, a balance of convenience, serious issue to be tried, uh, the Shimanius case in BC at page 25, the, the court there said that damages could be an appropriate remedy for loss of title or, or loss of use of occupation. That suggests that uh, there's going to be a, a, a very high onus for Aboriginal people to uh, 
present evidence regarding the unique character of the land in question to the Aboriginal party to defeat the presumption that damages would be a sufficient remedy. Uh, the Kit Katla case in BC, I think, also raises uh, important issues about uh, the kind of evidence that would have to be given to uh, tip the balance of convenience in an injunction situation in the favor of, of the Aboriginal people. And on that, uh, I, we comment at the bottom of page 29 that we think that the courts in BC uh, are really in error, uh, sorry, the bottom of page 30, in error in considering as part of the balance of convenience argument the likelihood of success in the main action. Because in one of the Kit, uh, Kit Catholic case, the court said, it's necessary to predict how the matter will end up before we give an injunction. It's, it's, it's my view that that's an issue with respect to whether there's a serious issue to be tried. It's not an issue regarding uh, the balance of convenience or the likelihood of success. The likelihood of success should be looked at under, under the first test. Is there a serious issue and not balance of convenience because balance of convenience puts a much higher onus on the Aboriginal applicant. Finally, where does this all leave us? I think uh, uh, there's certainly more clarity uh, on what needs to be addressed in evidence. Uh, Aboriginal title, we know now that the time is the time of declaration of sovereignty. Aboriginal rights, we know the time for the evidence is pre-contact. There's more clarity on oral history. From an Aboriginal perspective, there's a measuring stick, but the question is, will this clarity lead to few or more cases? It's my view it'll probably lead to, to more cases. And just a few concluding uh, thoughts on that. The Chief Justice in Dalgamook said, Section 35 is a strong base you should negotiate. And First Nations prefer negotiations because courts are long, expensive, and you don't know what's going to happen. But as you can see from the recent Seashell decision in BC, the First Nation that had an agreement in principle saying, no, no, now we're going to the court. There are a number of reasons for that. The first is that uh, federal government, in my view, is lowballing Aboriginal peoples at all these tables. They're basically saying, if they go to court, uh, the court's probably going to say this. So let's uh, go to the negotiating table and say our bottom line is you know, half of that. Because we know that to get the other half, the Aboriginal people are going to have substantial risk in going to the courts. At the same time, Aboriginal people are faced with the issue that while these cases are going on, it's business as usual. Permits are granted, mines are developed, trees are cut down. So it's not the normal kind of negotiations where the parties are, are, are equal. And uh, so I think what we're going to see is more cases rather than fewer because uh, people feel that in the, at the end of the day, and their ancestors have been saying this for so many years, they'll get a better uh, reception from the courts, although the issue of going to the courts and trying to get a judgment in Aboriginal title and then having to deal with uh, justifiable interference is, uh, is enormous. We're also going to see many more cases uh, going to court about good faith negotiations, whether the governments are negotiating in good faith and on the fiduciary duty. And Shin has cut me off at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. It's a very complex area with a lot of uh, complex law and uh, sociology and anthropology. Uh, there, we're going to take uh, maybe one or two questions before moving on to the next panelists. Is there anybody that? Well done, John. I guess you get a prize. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, well, we'll just go on to uh, the next speaker. That's me. <laughs> <laughs>
The whole of Northern Ontario is covered by a treaty. It's called the James Bay Treaty, or Treaty Number no. 9. It covers uh, uh, at least the parts that were signed in uh, 1905 and 1906, it covers 130,000 square miles. There was an adhesion in 1929 that covered uh, the rest of Ontario right to the Manitoba border. Uh, this land, most of this land is crown land, and uh, as you can imagine, there's lots of resource-related activity forestry, mining, uh, sports hunting, sports fishing, uh, these activities by non-Aboriginal people. There are also uh, traditional uses by Aboriginal people on this land. The uh, three recent decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, I think, provide us some guidance on how to balance the interests of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples, and that's what I want to talk about. And if you turn to tab four, my paper is on the impact of three of these cases, uh, Dalgamook in British Columbia, which uh, John has talked about. It's an Aboriginal title case. R.V. Marshall, which is from Nova Scotia, and that's a case that had to do with eel fishing in Nova Scotia, but subsequently it's become an issue about lobster fishing in New Brunswick. And the last case is R.V. Badger, which is a case about hunting on private land in Alberta. Uh, these three uh, decisions talk about the scope of Aboriginal rights, the scope of the Crown authority to uh, infringe or override Aboriginal treaty rights, and the balance between the federal authority and the provincial authority. <coughs> the uh, so let's uh, look at uh, provision in Treaty 9. What did the treaty say? Well, uh, it's uh, part of a series of numbered treaties that uh, stretch from Ontario uh, through the prairies and to the uh, Northwest Territories, and they're very common. Uh, in return for a surrender, you can see here the surrender clause, uh, purported surrender of all of the Indian interest in the territory covered by the treaty the Indians were given a signing bonus of $8 each and then as, uh, at that time and subsequently $4 each per year for individual and there's still ceremonies around uh, giving out of these $4. Uh, uh, in addition, there were small reserves. In the case of Treaty Number no. 9, uh, in return for the purported surrender of 130,000 square miles, 514 square miles total was allotted for reserve land and that uh, the 514 square miles had to be located in areas that were away, away from potential hydroelectric development. So if you look at this clause, it looks pretty straightforward if you just read the, uh, uh, what's written into it. Uh, but what actually happened in the negotiations? Well, uh, I'm going to show you another slide. Uh, for those of you that are having trouble in the back, uh, I'll just uh, read it out. Uh, Misabe was a blind chief, and the uh, treaty commissioners uh, would go around in canoes uh, to various Hudson's Bay posts to sign these treaties. And this is the uh, report by one of the treaty commissioners, Duncan Campbell Scott, about this particular uh, situation, although there are many reports by many treaty commissioners in many treaty areas uh, which basically say the same thing. Uh, Misabe says that he was afraid that the, if they signed the treaty, they would be compelled to reside upon the reserve to be set apart for them and would be deprived of the fishing and hunting privileges which they now enjoy. And what was the answer of the treaty commissioners in their own words? Uh, the, they told Misabe that their fears were groundless, 
as their present manner of making their livelihood would in no way be interfered with. So that's maybe uh, one version of what happened. That again looks pretty clear. Groundless, their fears were groundless. They would be interfered in no way. Now let's see what the treaty said. This is a great one for first year law school classes. <laughs> so, what did they get? Well, uh, the, according to the written version of the treaty, and uh, this treaty had been negotiated before they set off in their canoes uh, between the provincial and federal governments, and the, they weren't allowed to change a single word of the treaty. And surprise, surprise, they went to a dozen communities and they came back all the chiefs signed their X's on the treaty and not a word was changed. Uh, and this is the wording. So you can see that uh, it says that they're gonna have the right to pursue their usual vocations of hunting, trapping, and fishing throughout the tract surrendered. So this is the whole of the 130,000 square miles. Okay, so that sounds like the first, uh, the reported negotiation but this is where your law comes in. Where, where the fine print, well there's two areas of fine print. It says, subject to such regulations as may from time to time be made by the government of the country. Hey, you can hunt, unless we tell you you can't. That's the first one. What was the other condition? If you keep reading, it says, saving and accepting such tracts as may be required or taken up from time to time for settlement, mining, lumbering, trading, and other purposes. Even if we say you can't, if we put a town there, then you can't. Okay, so what are the meanings of those two clauses is the issue here. <clears throat> Now, if you ignore the previous slide, if you ignore the uh, report by the commissioner of the negotiations, if you ignore the oral history of the Aboriginal people about what happened, then, and you just look at this written pre-prepared text, it looks like it's pretty unfettered on the part of the Crown in terms of taking away from the hunting, fishing, and trapping rights uh, off reserve, that is not on the reserve, but off reserve for Aboriginal peoples. However, I, the uh, uh, situation I think is not that simple and the first clause, the government of the country clause has been interpreted and I won't go into uh, in, the, in the next part as I ex walk you through uh, the points, uh, I'm not going to have a lot of legal authorities, it's in my paper and the uh, academic articles, the Supreme Court of Canada cases, and other authority will be in there. So I won't be citing them as I go along, uh, just in case you think I'm making this up. <clears throat> the, um, okay, so there's two basic issues around the government of the country clause. Is there unfettered authority for the government to uh, make regulations which will be contrary to these hunting, fishing, and trapping rights? That's the first issue. Second issue is, which crown has the authority to do it? It doesn't say in there. Okay, with respect to the first issue, in the government of the country clause, this came up in a case called R.V. Badger, where the court said, uh, and there's also an Ontario Court of Appeal case called Bombay, uh, they said that in spite of what the treaty says, that does not give the government unfettered authority. 
that the, to use that clause, the government has to meet something called the Sparrow Test. And uh, though many of you may know this, uh, just to briefly run through it, what that test says is that in order to infringe Aboriginal treaty rights in Section 35.1, if a, a federal law is going to infringe those rights, that law has to, first of all, be there for a valid purpose. And secondly, it's got to preserve the honor of the Crown. So it can't just willy-nilly infringe Aboriginal rights. Uh, if it's going to infringe, and it can do so unilaterally according to the court, if it's going to infringe, it has to justify itself. So broadly analogous to a Section 1 a charter analysis in the sense that you can have an infringement, but what considerations do you take into, into uh, what do you take into consideration in order to infringe? Those are things like, did you consult? Did you infringe the Aboriginal right as little, or treaty right as little as possible? Is there compensation when that's appropriate? Those kind of things. You know, that show that uh, the uh, government is acting in a way that's mindful of the honor of the crown and the treaty right. So, it's not unfettered. They gotta go through, jump through some hoops in order to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is which crown? Okay, government of the country. Is that the federal and provincial crown? No, it's just the federal crown. So, uh, with and in fact, this is uh, there's a this is undisputed that the uh, pro uh, provincial government right now can't. Uh, set uh, limits on Aboriginal hunting for treaty rights to hunt for food, that those are done by federal regulation. Okay, so let's go on to the second one, the tracks taken up clause. If the same logic is followed, and I do provide authority for this in the paper, uh, in terms of the tracks that can be taken up for mining, settlement, etc. Can that be, be taken up unilaterally with unfettered authority as the provinces have done in general? The answer would be no, that they have to at least meet the Sparrow test, which means they have to sit down with the Aboriginal groups, figure out what they're doing, provide compensation if they're taking away these, uh, these rights, uh, uh, ensure that the interests of the Aboriginal peoples are protected, those types of things have to happen. And again, there's been a couple of uh, cases, both in Ontario and other jurisdictions, that have said this about this clause. The second thing is, which level of government can do that? Uh, again, following the, the logic of the, uh, the government of the country clause, it would be the provincial government does not have the authority that it would have to be the federal government. Now, in my paper, I do uh, I have a little bit more nuanced analysis, and there are arguments that say why the provincial government may have authority. The basic conclusion is that, first of all, it's not clear, and secondly, that the most legally consistent way to analyze this thing from a division of powers perspective is to say that it's just the federal government, not the provincial government. So, does that mean that everything that Ontario has done so far in terms of providing licenses for mining and forestry and giving out letters of pallet is illegal? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, I think that uh, you know, those are fixable problems if they are. Uh, the, you know, all the laws in Manitoba were struck down because they weren't in French at one point and they could fix that up. Uh, what's to say about uh, looking at the future? I think these are, are areas of great uncertainty, uh, which I think should push, and this is uh, reiterating the point that John Othius made, we should push the parties to a negotiating table, and I think the provincial and federal governments have to be looking at their bargaining positions in a different way, in a way that gives greater recognition than they have uh, up till now to these uh, hunting, uh, trapping, and fishing rights. So that's the uh, one implication, is that I think it does uh, call on a different attitude. I think that the second thing, and this is for uh, practitioners, uh, when you're advising municipalities, when you're advising resource companies, when you're advising government, uh, you can't 
ignore this. That I think it would be foolhardy to uh, ignore advising your clients about this. And I'll give you one example. There's a Japanese, big Japanese paper company called Daishowa. And Daishowa, uh, you know, they wanted to enter the Canadian market and they went to Alberta and they got a great deal for a whole bunch of wood in Alberta and a license and they were gonna go there and just cut the bejeevers out of there. But the, uh, there was a group called the Lubicon First Nation who hadn't signed a treaty and who didn't like these guys coming along. And the Lubicon, together with the urban supporters, uh, through a long thing, and I won't go through the whole history, has basically shut down that forest. Daishoa has just recently said, okay, we agree, we give up, we're not gonna cut there anymore, and we're not gonna buy anybody, any paper or any wood that's been cut from there. Okay, so that happened. Now, I don't know anything about who was advising Daishoa or anything, but if I was Daishoa and my lawyer didn't tell me that this could happen, I would be pretty pissed off. Then <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna leave you with. <laughs> okay, a uh, few minutes for questions before we go on to Stephen. Okay, what's the present value of the four dollars? Who deals with money here? I <laughs> or I don't know what the value of the four dollars would have been there, and I don't. Fifty times I'm hearing. Does that make it two hundred? Okay, does anybody in the audience uh, have one of those little actuarial things with a palm top? You know, can't they do everything? Okay, sorry. Okay, any other questions? Yes. I've got a question. I don't practice, so I think I'm uh, yes. Okay, that's... Is there any discussion of that transferable to this conference? I just want to come to that. Okay, I, I'm gonna repeat your question because so the people in the back could hear. I think it's very interesting. Uh, this uh, gentleman has said that he practices uh, constitutional administrative law and that in that context, uh, there are, are ways of interpreting words like regulation that will allow a certain scope but uh, not a scope that will end up extinguishing or, uh, or prohibiting a certain activity in certain contexts. And so the question was whether those types of principles had been applied to, uh, to the interpretation of, uh, for example, the regulations of the country clause. Did, did I get that correct? That's okay, the that's the question. The, uh, uh, yes, and the, uh, there have been several cases looking at this regulations of the country, mostly in the context of division of powers, and they all say it's got to be federal. So uh, now, the, can that regulate to the point of extin extinction? I think that the recent cases would, you would then go to R.V. Sparrow and look at that justification test that, that I talked about earlier. I, I don't think, and I can't recall my, uh, uh, whether uh, specifically municipal law or administrative law principles have been drawn in in that analysis uh, myself. I can't remember that. Okay, I think that the, we'll now go on to the next speaker, and then after that, there'll be time for general uh, questions. I want to uh, welcome uh, Stephen Smart, who will then uh, lead us out of this morass into the bright future that awaits us all as we live in harmony. Thank you very much, uh, Shin. It's a, a pleasure to be here.
Um, I do want to acknowledge the uh, uh, support I had from Jacqueline Code in uh, writing the paper, which you will find at tab six. I had the, I hope this is something that happens to everyone in this audience. Uh, having been faced with uh, the requirement of doing a paper, uh, Jackie came to me and said, I'd like to help. This was good news because she is one of our very, very bright lawyers in our legal research department and uh, also had clerked in the Supreme Court of Canada and clerked at the time that the Delgamook case had gone through that court. So indeed it was a very pleasurable experience for me to have her assistance on the paper. Um, it's just, I just want to tie in, um, John talked about the importance of oral uh, evidence, uh, just, uh, just a little minor digression um, before I get into self-government. Um, and uh, uh, Shin then uh, put up uh, part of the James Bay Treaty. That's, that's the treaty area that I spend a lot of time in, Treaty 9, which is the top third of the province of Ontario. And uh, I just want to, uh, you know, just as listening to them, uh, it, it's so remarkable to me uh, when uh, we are traveling to uh, First Nation communities in the remote part of uh, northern Ontario and have our meetings in gyms at schools and so on, uh, information sessions talking about self-government, how many people still come forward with their oral stories about the days that Mr. Scott went down the river to get the treaty signed? Uh, it's really uh, an incredible resource, an important resource, and of course, it's, it's fine right now and it's timely right now for the courts to be saying oral traditions and history are important, but a lot of this evidence is out there now and will not be there in the future. Uh, we hear incredibly interesting stories, uh, grandmothers that remember being six years old when the canoe came down and what a, an event it was and uh, all of that, but it's, uh, it's a very, very real issue and of course oral uh, tradition can be passed generation to generation, uh, the courts don't deny that, but some of the primary sources of this evidence is uh, sort of at a dying end and so it's uh, very interesting but it ties together what uh, John is saying, the courts are open to it. Um, and uh, of course, uh, very much so, it's very important to interpret the treaties. And uh, Treaty 9, where I do, as I say, I do a lot of work, there's an awful lot of oral history that's very relevant to a document which on its face uh, has such uh, vast implications. Self-government is an issue uh, that will define who we are as a people, what kind of country we will be, what values we subscribe, um, in recognizing issues of self-determination, albeit within the context of an existing confederation. It is a contemporary issue that goes to the root and to the heart of Canada. It is a core issue of our time. To many people, self-government may seem like a new issue, an issue that in the last decade has become very hot an issue which has, largely because of the poor public education system we have had in Canada, at least in the past, left many Canadians very perplexed and bewildered and incapable of uh, effectively discussing the issue or understanding it. How can Section 91 and 92 powers uh, of the Constitution be carved up yet to another government? Isn't the allocation of Section 91-92 powers complete? This seemed to be the view of the British Columbia Court of Appeal as the Delgama uh, case passed through that court. Where would Aboriginal self-government models fit within our Constitution? Would it amount to a third order of government? And that is the position that the BC Liberal Party is advancing in its litigation in attacking the recently negotiated Niska Treaty. Is Aboriginal government an inherent right? What does inherent right mean? The issue of self-government is older than most Canadians would think. As Aboriginal peoples assert, it goes back to time immemorial. To understand the issue, we have to do a very quick trip over some pretty important and neglected history. Before that, and to contextualize the issue, I want to direct your attention, though, to two important documents, um, uh, contemporary documents of our history. The first is section 35. Listen to the simple one-line sentence. We had it on the board, the existing Aboriginal Treaty, uh, Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of Aboriginal Peoples of Canada 
are hereby recognized and confirmed. A simple sentence, a sentence with no definition, a short sentence, a compromise sentence, very much the short end of a stick compared to what Aboriginal peoples wanted incorporated into the Constitution in 1982 at the time Canada repatriated our constitutional heritage. However, as it turns out, crumbs are better than nothing. And this short sentence has become the source of so much important case law, particularly from the Supreme Court of Canada, which has closed those words with considerable meaning and those cases extend to the area of self-government. So the first document we have to keep in mind, we are at section, 80, uh, section 35, dating from 1982. The second document I want you to uh, have in mind is a 1995 government policy entitled Aboriginal Self-Government, the Government of Canada's Approach to the Implementation of the Inherent Right and the negotiation of self-government. This government policy was really the government's reaction and response to the failed Charlottetown Accord, an accord which had many provisions uh, for improved Aboriginal uh, rights within Canada and held great promise for Aboriginal communities. It is in this document, this policy document, that the uh, federal government states, the government of Canada recognizes the inherent right of self-government as an existing right within section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. So we have in 1995 the government announcing and adopting a policy that self-government is an inherent right of Aboriginal peoples within the meaning of Section 35. It does not say who has the right, which Aboriginal peoples, or the scope or extent of that right. We will return to these two documents shortly, but um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that what we're dealing with right now on the self-government issue is how does self-government fit within Section 35 so we're going to be, you know, that's going to be the evolving case law, the, the guaranteed protected constitutional rights, and the government, current government policy, which has been in place since 1995. But I think I, I'm going to do this really quickly, and I don't, hope it's not a disservice to uh, what is a long and important history, but we have to start with pre-contact society. And I think it's trite and obvious that prior to the arrival of Europeans uh, that Aboriginal peoples not only occupied the lands to which the settlers came, but the Aboriginal peoples were organized into established societies with formalized governments at their core. That we have to take as a given, and I say as a given, uh, in the sense that it is our best understanding, and it took a lot of non-Aboriginal Canadians to come to that conclusion, believe it or not, but the uh, historical research uh, done by historians and researchers is uh, coming up uh, uh, in spades on that issue. And our Canadian courts have accepted that proposition, and it may seem a rather uh, trite thing, but it's important. Before we came, societies existed that were governed uh, internally by Aboriginal groups. The, one of the most important uh, documents in uh, the development of Aboriginal uh, constitutional history is the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Remember the fall of France, 1759? And uh, most of us, I think, were taught that the Royal Proclamation was sort of a unilateral declaration by the British Crown. And the idea behind the Royal Proclamation, and I'm being very simple here, was really to draw a north-south line so that settlers would be living to the east of the, line, the, the border. And this, this line went through a good heart, of, uh, part, heart and part of North America. And to the west, First Nations would continue to live in their traditional ways. And the words of the Royal Proclamation were that settlers were not to molest or disturb Aboriginal persons. 
So the significance is the Royal Proclamation really understood that Abor Aboriginal life would continue in its traditional form, which surely included government um, powers and organization. Um, Professor John Boros at uh, University of Toronto Law School has done a, a rather remarkable paper on the Royal Proclamation in which his argument is that the Royal Proclamation should not be looked at as a unilateral declaration of the British Crown, but part of a treaty that was concluded the following year it, known as the Treaty of Niagara. So the um, significance is, uh, however, that uh, in, in, at the time uh, there was a recognition by the Crown of the independence uh, of traditional uh, Aboriginal governance. And that began the very uh, significant period of treaty taking, treaty making, whatever you want to call it, uh, that went across the central part of Canada. In the earlier stages, there were what were called the Friendship uh, Treaties in uh, the Maritimes, but uh, Ontario, Quebec, and the Prairies uh, um, uh, were, were dealt with um, by the process of treaty making. And the significance of a lot of the treaties, and some of them were early, some of them predated the turn of the uh, 20th century and the late uh, 19th century. Some of them were at the very beginning of the uh, 20th century, and some went up to uh, uh, in the case of Treaty 9, there were some adhesions or, uh, to the treaty around 1929, 1930 to add to the big land base that had already uh, been obtained in 1906. But the significance is that these were treaties that were obtained in many cases on the basis of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. If not nation-to-nation, government-to-government. And there may be some quarrels sometimes as to whether we were dealing, uh, whether Canada was dealing with nations or governments. But the significance was there was a real understanding that what we are dealing with are a people that are organized and do have a society and have power to enter into treaties. And I think in our generation, that's what we're facing with is the great increase uh, in knowledge of what these treaties were all about because most of us grew up in a system that uh, uh, um, really uh, provide us with no information of the significance of these treaties, how they were negotiated, what, uh, what they meant, and the fact that they are more than just a piece of paper with some signatures. They are very uh, solemn and enduring obligations of the government uh, to uh, Aboriginal people. So we go through these uh, treaties, and from a, a, I think there are just a few points to make. Number one, they recognize because we are negotiating, I'll use the word negotiating, and uh, Shin has said it was hardly a negotiation, it was just getting signatures, but we were uh, obtaining surrenders of vast amounts of land in exchange for very modest uh, financial benefits uh, to First Nations. But we were dealing with First Nations, and we were dealing with them as a collective entity uh, that obviously had some form of governmental power. Now, the next part of uh, Aboriginal history is perhaps our saddest stage, and uh, most people uh, figure the date 1876 is the key. Uh, but in fact, there were pre-Confederation statutes that equally dealt with an assimilationist uh, attitude uh, of control over First Nations. But uh, 1876 is the first Indian Act passed under the BNA Act. So it was uh, Johnny MacDonald's uh, first exercise of power in creating the Indian Act. And of course, it's gone through many uh, uh, amendments. Uh, some of them, uh, as it went on, tightened the noose around uh, Aboriginal communities. And finally, in 1951, some of the more horrendous provisions uh, were repealed. But nevertheless, from our, the discussion of self-government, the implication was the government imposed a statutory act compelling First Nations uh, to order themselves by way of government by band council, an elected band council system. No negotiation, no discussion. This is the way it's going to be. You're going to have your band council, and we are going to control the laws you may create. Now, just think of uh, the Sparrow case and justification. None of that. This is just straight. This is the law. And of course, this history of assimilation went from, if we use 1876, we're just dealing with that right now in trying to undo the Indian Act as it applies on uh, government issues. So um, I guess one of the issues is that throughout this rather long period, many First Nations uh, have been compelled to have a form of government governance that is told, uh, explained to them. Um, or imposed on them. Accordingly, 
What does that mean? Do they have an existing right to self-government? Because by the time of 1982, some of them have spent 100 years under the Indian Act with a band council that was ordered by Canada. So you can see some of the problems. On the other hand, something that's imposed, not negotiated, not consented to, how can you say any rights were surrendered or extinguished? And in spite of the India, Indian Act, many communities were able to uh, carry on tr some aspects of traditional uh, governance, uh, although in much modified forms. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm going to move very quickly because of the time. Um, remember Meech Lake, 1987, that's following 1982 amendments, and the, the discovery that Quebec was a distinct society. Well, you can imagine the impact that has on Aboriginal communities who were not mentioned in the Accord at all, no rights proposed for them, and so you can imagine the reaction, and so we have Elijah Harper, Harper's uh, act in uh, turning down the legislation in the Manitoba um, legislature. We then get to the Charlottetown Accord, a very high point in terms of the development by uh, Canada and the provinces to create Aboriginal uh, rights. That uh, accord, in fact, would have recognized um, Aboriginal uh, self-government as an inherent right. It would have stated in it and did so state that it would be a third order of government within Canada. Of course, it went down the tubes, and that was 1992. So here we are in 1992 we're back to section 35. So that is our hallmark uh, section in spite of all this political and constitutional uh, work. Now, the inherent right policy, I'm gonna have to move pretty quickly, um, recognizes inherent right of self-government as an existing Aboriginal right under section 35. As I've indicated, it doesn't define it, doesn't say what it means or which Aboriginal groups have it. Is it all 600 First Nations in Canada? Is it collective groups of them? It doesn't say. Um, what the policy says, it's time to lay down the rhetoric. It's time to work towards and negotiate practical and workable self-government arrangements. And uh, I think the government obviously recognizes that every uh, First Nation community, every tribal council, every confederacy has different circumstances. And so self-government will be negotiated on a unique base basis to each uh, community. There will be no one-size-fits-all. The uh, policy um, is very clear that uh, the Aboriginal governments, uh, I hate to use the word created because if you believe in inherent right, you are recognizing something in a power that already exists, but that such new governments will not be sovereign in an international law sense. The negotiations will not result in sovereign independent states in the international law sense. Rather, arrangements would be negotiated where Aboriginal peoples would govern themselves on matters internal to their communities or matters integral to their unique cultures, language, um, identity, and so on. The policy does not mention third order of government, and of course that's very much subject to attack now that the first completed model is the Nishka treated, uh, Treaty, and on May 18th of this year, the first set of laws under the new uh, Nishka parliament were passed but the uh, attempt of the BC Liberal Party uh, in their litigation is to set aside uh, the uh, treaty on the basis that what has been created could not be created except for by way of constitutional amendment and not by negotiated agreement. Um, just very quickly, the policy sets out, and if you look at page 35, a whole list of, of powers that the federal government is prepared to concede and agree that are issues that uh, First Nations have clear authority to enact laws in, um, and in which if there is conflict between the province and the feds, Aboriginal law on these issues in their communities will um, um, prevail. And you can see items like marriage, adoption, child welfare, education, health, uh, policing are all issues that are recognized as integral to uh, Aboriginal communities. There's then on page 36 a list of a, a long list of items the government is prepared to negotiate and permit Aboriginal lawmaking in those areas. But if there again comes to be conflict between those provisions of Aboriginal lawmaking and feds and province, the province or the fed will uh, prevail. And then on page 37, there's a list of items that uh, obviously are not um, the um, not up for negotiation, 
issues of defense, external affairs, treaty making powers, immigration, fiscal policy, post offices, things that are uh, thought of of national importance and uh, are not uh, possible areas of negotiation for self-government. Um, there is much, much to say on this area. Uh, there is a lot happening across Canada. Um, I wish we uh, did have a little more time. Um, and I just really will tell you that uh, you're all aware of Nunavut. That's a, a very uh, recent example. That the negotiations with Nunavut started long before the, uh, in, uh, the uh, introduction of the uh, uh, self-government policy in 1995. But that's a public government model. The Nishka model is a model of uh, where there's a central government and four separate governments, and it's a combination of sharing powers between the central authority of the four communities, and each four community will have their own powers to pass laws in areas that uh, affect them. In Saskatchewan, work is well underway uh, in negotiating a province-wide model where all First Nations will uh, um, uh, be part of the uh, model that's created. Um, an example of a single First Nation getting uh, self-government rights would be the Sioux Valley um, in uh, Manitoba, where uh, uh, they're very close to a final agreement. So I'll end there. It's a fascinating field. It's a fascinating area to practice law. Uh, it's a very complicated area, and it's a very difficult area. Uh, but as I say, um, and there are a lot of problems that are getting uh, at common tables. You might be interested to know that probably at this point there's 85 different negotiation tables that work across Canada uh, dealing with self-government issues. In Ontario alone, there's probably 10 tables dealing with self-government issues in different parts of Ontario. Um, so it's uh, incredibly interesting. The map of uh, Canada is surely being withdrawn, and there's surely some, going to be some uh, important legal issues associated with these, uh, this policy development. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. The, uh, I'm sure you have lots more to say if anyone wanted to ask you a question about any of these specific negotiations. Uh, we have around uh, 10 minutes left here for uh, questions or comments. I, I would ask that uh, if you are, uh, just for the sake of the audience, because it's not mic, if you could stand up and uh, try to speak in a loud voice and then I'll, or one of the panelists will repeat back the questions so everyone can hear before we answer. So. Uh, okay, do you want to repeat the question? Do you want me to? Okay, sure you repeat Okay, I'll, I'll just repeat the question and then I, I'll uh, have Stephen. The, um, uh, Wilford uh, has said that the uh, treaties, uh, the original traditional treaties were, so the historical treaties were signed government to government or nation to nation, which presupposes that they were nations. If the treaties that are being signed now uh, were, uh, don't recognize the power for external affairs and all those areas listed by Stephen, then uh, it appears that they aren't independent nations. So the question posed is, well, isn't there a contradiction uh, with respect to what happened historically and the types of treaties that are being signed now? Did uh, I get that right? Yeah, okay, I'll try and uh, respond to that. Uh, uh, it's a good question and it's a good point. And uh, when we uh, visit uh, communities, uh, certainly in NAN, uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation in Northern Ontario, uh, we receive many, many submissions that what are we doing at this table doing things that may in fact curtail our rights 
right? Because maybe our inherent right is greater than, than what we're talking about the table. As a question of policy, first of all, the policy is clearer that these negotiations are only authorized by the uh, federal government and the federal government is at the table on the basis of coming to practical arrangements that both communities uh, can agree to. And so to your question, uh, number one is the people with whom negotiations are take, uh, taking place, of course, don't always agree with government policy and there's lots of uh, criticisms to be made of it. Um, however, um, what may happen is that some of these agreements that are reached, which are practical arrangements and which may come into law either in different ways, by way of contract, by way of modern day treaty, because there's provision for making uh, these uh, treaty, modern day treaties, uh, or by way of uh, legislation um, that uh, authorizes the agreements that are reached. Um, and so the, the, the real question, I think, uh, apart from the, the nice question you've asked is, are First Nations in any way uh, curtailing their rights? But the agreements are all very clear and First Nations are the first to be very careful on this point. All of them make it clear that nothing in these agreements are abrogating or derogating from whatever constitutional rights they may have, which if, it's, if it is an inherent right, um, may exist at a greater level than the agreement itself. But, uh, so we've got a mixture of ideology, which is expressed in your question, and important, uh, more than ideology, some real views that uh, many First Nations have. Um, many First Nations, or I should say some First Nations, wouldn't participate in these provisions just for the very question you raise. They feel uh, that, uh, and maybe quite rightly, uh, they are curtailing um, their powers by doing so. But John, I'll bet you have something to say about that. Well, yes, I, I sit on, uh usually the First Nations side in, or always on the First Nations side in the uh, self-government negotiations. And um, the Canada's policy uh, on, uh, on paper, uh, in my view, is, is fairly deceptive. And if you look at the list that uh, Stephen has talked about, education is in the realm of First Nations. Well, I'm a very practical example. I'm dealing with negotiations in Labrador now with the Innu people on their right to uh, educate. Um, it's subject to, and this is a federal and provincial government position, subject to the Innu meeting provincial curriculum standards. It's subject to accreditation of teachers by uh, provincial accrediting agencies, and you can go down the list. So just as, uh, you know, in uh, Treaty 9, they said, oh, we can fish and hunt? Well, great. But the small prince says, oh, by the way, it's sub those subject twos are still there, and it's not just for the, the big issues like external affairs. It goes down to all the issues. For, so for the Innu, and for many communities, the issue is, uh, we have teachers in these schools who don't speak English. The kids only speak any moon language. And you're saying that in order to have a school system, we have to have uh, teachers accredited by uh, your body. And, and the Nishka Treaty doesn't settle that. The Nishka Treaty says there may be an accrediting agency set up by the Nishka people if that accrediting agency meets the provincial standards. So in effect, Canada's implementation, I'm suggesting, of the inherent government is a delegated uh, authority. There's not, it's not going to give content to Section 35. What it is, from the government approach, I think the courts have said something different, Stephen and I, but Section 91 and Section 92, the education authority of the provincial government, in my view, does not extend to Aboriginal peoples. Their education authority comes from Section 35, but in negotiations, governments are not taking that position. And I can go down the list. So the only agreements that are actually being signed are agreements in which, for the most part, uh, federal and provincial standards and regulations have to be met. On the conflict and paramountcy issues, in most cases, federal and provincial laws have to be paramount, or the federal and provincial governments won't sign these agreements. So, uh, and that's why many First Nations are saying, to heck with those tables, let's go back to court and have the courts 
gives some firm direction as to what governments have to do at the tables. So now that's that's uh, we can carry on this debate, but that's that's my view of, of being at these tables for many years and uh, sharing the frustration of the First Nations people over these very practical issues. We have to have teachers that don't speak the language of our kids as opposed to, and you call that, the expression of the inherent right of education, well, nonsense. And I agree, it's nonsense. I can hardly wait to have a discussion with uh, John because I'm uh, involved in some education discussions in Northern Ontario. Uh, and certainly we do not subscribe to the same principles that he's uh, advancing in his negotiation, but it may vary table to table, too. There certainly are some problems with federal policy, and it's evolving, and you know, believe me, if we think the policy is there and we all understand it, we all invent it every day we're at the table because uh, we're answering questions or asking questions that are not clear in the policy itself. Uh, of course, provincial governments are at most of these tables, too, which adds a whole new dimension. Except in Ontario. <laughs> Except in Ontario. We won't talk about Ontario. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much. I think that draws our uh, session to a close. Thanks for that last question, Wilfred. And uh, if you want to ask questions afterwards, you can come up and uh, the three of us will be available.